Hi everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight for the Adventure Speaker Series 2021. Um, we want to make sure when you come in uh, that you do stay muted for a little bit um, and then we'll get started. So the Adventure Speaker Series is a production of Five Rivers Metro Parks and Wright State University. Um, on the odd years, uh, we do the Speaker Series and on the even years, we do the Adventure Summit which is held at Wright State University. So we want to make sure that you save the dates for February 11th and 12th, uh, 2022. The Adventure Summit, um, like I said, is held at Wright State University. We have over 40 different adventure presentations, so it's a lot larger than the speaker series that we're doing this year. We do have uh, expo with exhibitors of retailers, outfitters, and other uh, clubs and organizations. Music, used gear, bouldering competition, tri paddle sports, uh, fitness classes, indoor triathlon, and a bunch of other uh, fun things to do. So make sure you save the date for that in February 2022. For this year's uh, Adventure Speaker Series, we are on our third presen uh, presenter for the year, um, and we have Broken Pieces, Injury and Survival on the Oregon Desert Trail uh, with Stacy Boone. And next week we will have, um, or yep, the 1st of April, um, we'll have Ellen Falterman, um, who will talk about her experience um, out on various rivers and kind of how she kind of goes through her life. So we wanna make sure that you check that out. And then we have a few others later in April. So for all this information, you can go to theadventuresummit.com. You can also go to the Adventure Summit Facebook page um, where all of these presenters have their own uh, Facebook events and you can get their live links um, on the Facebook page and then of course on the website as well. So tonight uh, we will have Stacy uh, Boone come on and tell us her story. Stacy is a guide and uh, owner of Step Outdoors and Stacy, I will hand it off to you. Hold on, hold on. And while she's getting ready, make sure you all um, remember to put your questions in the question and answer, uh, and we will get to those at the end, or end of the uh, presentation. Okay, I think we are up now. I don't know how to confirm that one way or the other. Um, but hi everybody, my name is Stacy Boone. I am the owner of Step Outdoors. I'd like to thank Metro Parks and Wright State University for inviting me to participate in the um, speaker series that we have going on um, this year. Uh, this is a very different way for us to be doing these types of presentations. Um, so just bear with us as particularly me, I work through the kind of technology part. Um, so what I'm doing tonight is I am sharing with you a story of how a planned 750 mile hike was abruptly stopped by the simple fall and a broken patella. This was uh, something very much unplanned as we can all hear. Um, and it was really fun to kind of go back and look at these photos when I was putting it up in presentation. And this one is with my legs splinted after I got to the top of my initial self rescue. But what makes me laugh about this photo is that it's not even my splint is not even placed properly at this point. Um, my splint has slid down quite a bit, um, but we want to talk a little bit about that as this as this uh, presentation goes forward. I am the owner of Step Outdoors, so I am a backpacking guide company. Um, our company is set so that we can give people the knowledge, the skill, and the confidence so that they'll go out and do more adventuring. And you only get more confidence by practicing, talking with people, and learning everything that you can um, to go out and be a safe recreationalist. And this can be backpacking, hiking, um, rafting, any water work, or any bike work. I do want to put a couple of disclaimers in before I start this presentation. Um, this photo here is actually the box that came back to me from search and rescue um, after it's about two months after the accident took place. 
and you'll see that in this box there will be my gaiters there's a stove there's my shoes and you'll notice that they don't have shoelaces and also the map what i want you to understand is that i have over 20,000 miles under my belt. So I've been doing a lot of backpacking for a lot of years now. I've been backpacking for 20 years, started my um, first hike on the Appalachian Trail in 1998, followed that later with a completion of the Pacific Crest Trail, the Continental Divide Trail, and lots of little uh, trails in, in between. Even with that, guiding people, spending thousands of miles um, in the summer on trails, what I want you to understand, if you understand nothing else from this presentation, is that anyone can have a bad day. And I mean anyone. Everything can be going along, look like it's going well, that there are no problems, and it just takes one simple fall, one limb falling from a tree that could make something with, that was going very smoothly to something that becomes an emergency situation. I want to emphasize that this was merely an accident and um, that ha accidents happen. They happen for good reasons, bad reasons, or no reasons at all. And I am fond of telling my clients when they spend time with me is that you can do everything right and something can still go wrong. Um, I want you to know that I'm not sponsored by anybody. All my adventures I fund. We live in a day and age now now where there's a lot of GoFundMe for adventures, um, a lot of sponsorship. Sponsorship and funding changes your adventures, whether you think it does or not. What it does is it requires you to think differently. It requires you to meet other obligations. I am just selfish enough to recognize that I don't want to be sponsored and that I want to be responsible for my own funding. That ensures that the, my hike is for me and that I can continue to make the safest decisions possible because I am not obligated to any other people. There is often a question that comes to me, do I still guide? Yes, I am 10 years of the primary owner for Step Outdoors. I am still a guide and I would not guide clients if I didn't think I was quite capable of continuing with that endeavor. And it would be remiss if I didn't say thank you to the many, many people who have taken care of me for the last couple years. Um, it is still an ongoing process to put together the broken pieces. So what we're going to talk about is the Oregon Desert Trail. Um, the Oregon Desert Trail, and I have totally paraphrased this, is a 750 mile trail located in Oregon. It is in the high desert region. You do get a lot of the deserty landscape that is here. It's a trail that is stitched together through existing trails, old Jeep tracks, historic wagon trails. It has a lot of cross country travel for it. There is um, a very big because there are over 50 pages of printable maps. So these are the things that I use to prepare for my hike. I spent months actually planning for this particular hike and uh, 750 miles. What I had intended was an average of about 20 miles a day and an average of about 120 miles a week. Um, this trail is remote. Uh, even though you may get some of these two tracks that you're going to see in this bottom left hand side picture, you would be out there and not see anyone for days and days at a time. And if you look at the top left hand picture, what you'll notice is that looks like a wide open canyon there and you're going to have to kind of weed your way through that. So it is a choose your own adventure type of approach meaning that you can follow the trail as it is encouraged by the guidebook or you can shift and move it around to something that becomes a little bit more well marked for your particular preference. Um, for this trail, this is not a beginner trail in any way, shape or form. Um, you need to have map and compass skills when coming out there. The guidebook does allocate the GPS um, waypoints so that you could actually follow your GPS the entire way if you'd like to do that. That was not my choice for doing this particular. So one of the first principles of leave no trace is plan ahead and prepare. And this is something I instill upon my clients is that whenever you're doing any type of recreational activity, you need to plan to have a good hike, a good experience. And that comes with spending the time at home perusing, investigating, researching, looking at all the details that are necessary to ensure that you can have a successful adventure. 
So this is what I did for this particular hike. This is how I knew that I was going to average about 120 miles a week. I planned all of my town stops. What I knew was that there wasn't a lot of big towns along the way, so I'd have to prep the food to go. Um, so I did a lot of mail, um, excuse me, mail drops planned before I even walked out the door. One of the other really important components of plan ahead and prepare is that you need to know what the purpose is of your of your adventure. And for me, my adventure, this was very purposeful and that I wanted something that was very challenging. I wanted something that was going to use all of my skills. I wanted to be mentally and and physically tested while I was out there. I wanted to do something that not everyone was doing and I wanted to do it the old school way. I wanted to use map and compass and be able to wind my way from point A to point B. I started this hike with a 22 pound pack and that included carrying four liters of water. So I had pared down to the bare essentials in order to do this hike, but wanted to do that in a manner that I thought was safe and that I could always um, keep myself secure in case something were to actually go wrong. So what I'm going to tell you is that on this particular hike, I started on April 15th. Um, my cousin took me out to the trailhead. I started a little later in the day than I would have maybe chosen to do, but I got there just fine and I headed out on the trail. Within 72 minutes on this trail, my hair was all tangled up. I had brush in my hair. I'd already skinned up my legs. And by the second hour in this trail, only being four miles in, I had taken my first fall. And that first fall that I took, and we all know as recreationalists, falling is a part of what we do. I fell down, hit both of my knees on a piece of rock, and it was enough that it kind of took the breath out of me. But we fall and that's what we do. So I just kind of rolled over. I sat there and I had a big old 680 calorie chocolate chip muffin snack, got myself regrouped and continued hiking. Little did I know that this was gonna be kind of the foundation of how my hike was gonna be. So that was on April 15th when I got started. On April 20th, 85 miles later, I took a second fall and that fall was after crossing the Jordan Creek and I'll show pictures of that in a few moments, but I, I fell crossing the Jordan Creek on a piece of volcanic rock that even now I can tell you exactly what it looked like. It was a simple fall. I felt the thud and I knew instantly that my knee was broken. So how did we get there? What are these things that happen? How do you get out of a situation like that? Well, the first thing I want you to understand, because there's no way a lot of you have seen me in presentations before at Wright State, I've been presenting there for almost 10 years, that we're not going to go through a presentation and not have some sort of educational component. You need to understand that for every adventure that you participate in, there are five whys of a bad day. It's either too hot, too cold, you're too hungry, you're too thirsty, or you're too tired. And all of these whys play into one another. And we can be very uh, matter of fact about that. If you're too hot, you get fatigued. You're not stopping and you're drinking. You're making bad choices and decisions. And one bad choice is the catalyst of what continues to happen. It's a snowball effect to the other bad decisions that you are likely to make in the day. So I'm always very conscious of making sure that I'm having a snack every hour, hour and a half, that I am stopping when it's too hot, that I'm putting on my layers when I'm too cold, that I'm stopping early in the day if I feel tired and I'm starting later in the day if I feel that I'm too tired. The photograph at the top here is actually my last camp and you'll notice that I'm looking right over where the sunrise comes for the day. I felt good starting this day. It had been a very challenging week up to this point, but I felt good with what it was that I was doing and the skills that I possessed. So while I'm going to tell you that there are five whys of a bad day, I'm going to ask you this and then you can ponder this for the end of the presentation. Is there a sixth reason of why you can have a bad day? The next thing I want you to understand is that being a guide, I don't feel like I'm any more knowledgeable or equipped than you can be with having a successful outdoor adventure. I understand that I need to carry my 10 essentials. I understand that I need to be aware of the variables that can make 
things get messy somewhere in the day, but I also very much have valued the what if statements. And this is something that all of you as recreationalists should be doing. You should be doing this before you head out on any adventure. You should be doing this in the big picture and the big scope of the experiences that you're having. And these what if statements are really simple. It is, if this were to happen, what will be my response? And these responses can be such as, or these questions can be, I might not reach my water source, or what if I break an arm? Any of these things give you a, a chance to really analyze what you think your response will be if something goes awry. Because what you're trying to do is avoid having to think about it for the very first time. You know, once you have to th think about it for the very first time, you're always going to be a bit behind. So being knowledgeable that something may happen, these are what my responses would be. And of course, your response first is going to be, I'm not going to panic, right? We know that that's what the, the logical response is, but if you fit, can you physically do that is going to be the question. So I would implore upon you, to think about some time during this presentation and think about this for your next recreational opportunity that if something to happen, what is your response going to be? Because that is going to keep you safer in the back. So this is my story and I don't tell this story because I want people to think that, oh, I did this wild and wonderful thing and I got lucky. Um, I don't believe in luck. Um, I don't believe that I have done anything that is any, any more or less capable than what you can do as a recreationalist. Um, things happen, you've got to be prepared, and this is how I dealt with my particular scenario. Um, the one thing that I did immediately following this is that I sat down and I wrote an essay and I knew that the essay was going to be very important for me in order to process what I had done, what the experiences were. And part of that was because I wanted to know what mistakes I had made along the way. And it's good to self analyze that and, and take it very seriously so that you don't make those mistakes again. Um, I am going to tell you I didn't have to work really hard at this essay and part of the reason for that is that I kept a nightly journal and in my journal as I was incorporating that into my essay all of the signs had been there. All of the warnings had been there that something was going to happen and so I want to backtrack a little bit regardless of your spiritual belief, your religious beliefs, I don't have that religious foundation. I believe very much in that nature dictates and that's who I should appreciate. But I also believe very much in this sixth sense. The idea, and I teach you know my women backpackers particularly, if you don't feel that something is right, you need to change that scenario so that you feel safe. I think tuition is extremely valuable for um, any type of activity that we're doing, whether it be at home or beyond. And there is this kind of statement that is said, and I want to go find it in my journal here real fast, that says intuition is only purposeful when used with attentiveness, processing of information, attention to the small details that don't seem to add up or to or feel too coincidental an idiom, but only in the practice of out of place, obscure meaning or understanding. Scientific studies share that an area of the human brain called the anterior caligulate cortex raises the alarm about danger without ever penetrating the conscious mind. Can it be argued that the conscious mind does not want to recognize the signs? So what you need to know is that as the lead guide for Step Outdoors, I had made a very conscious decision at the end of 2018 to take a sabbatical. I had felt like one of the reasons for taking the sabbatical, sabbatical was that things just weren't on par with what they needed to be. I felt like all my skills were on top, that I wasn't you know, shortcutting anything, but what I felt like is that my time was due, that, that something was due to happen. And that's kind of a really weird feeling and it's a very 
uncomfortable feeling to have as an individual who, who spends as much time outside as I do. So my husband and I agreed that we would take a sabbatical and we traveled quite a bit through the end of 2018 and going into 2019. When we got uh, to the time when I was leaving, leaving for this hike, this was the last big kind of event that I was doing as a part of the sabbatical. I'd agreed to go ahead and teach a few courses during the summer. Um, so this was my last big kind of go out there and do something I hadn't done for a while. But there were some interesting that, things that were taking place as a part of this. You know, normally when you're doing a long distance hike or you're doing something fun, people are giving you that kind of attaboy, you know, have a great time. We look forward to the pictures. We can't, you know, wait to read the journals. Like there's this excitement that brews around a hike. And I never felt like when I walked out the door for this hike that I was getting that kind of support system. What I felt like I was getting was you need to be careful. You need to make good choices and you need to make good decisions. And you know, that was easy for me. I was like, like sure, I will do that because I'm a solo backpacker on a 750 mile, very remote trail. Why would I not make good choices and decisions? So I had committed to that. But then some other things started adding up and these are the things that I talk about in my journal. My journal talks about how different kind of incidents and occurrences and um, again, regardless of your spirituality, some things just kind of connected as a part of this hike. So I uh, left Pagosa Springs, Colorado. I flew to Boise and I spent a few days with my cousins. Great people. These are the people you want to be your family. I mean, they are the most loving, caring individuals that you can have. And they let me as a, you know, dirty, scruffy hiker come into the house. And then they actually came and picked me up after the accident. So I spent a few days with them and, you know, if one conversation leads to another and I can feel some of the tension kind of getting there about there is some concern about me going for this hike. I kind of I always toss that off because unless you long distance backpack, it's hard for people to understand what that is about. So I let some of that go. But here's what I did as a part of our, one of our conversations. They asked me if I would load up. Basically, I call it a stalking app. It is a it's an app that you can see where your friends are, I guess. So I was like, sure, I will load that up onto my phone and every evening at camp I will um, turn on my phone. I will let it ping. If it pings great, you know where I'm at. If it doesn't ping, then you know no more information, but not to be worried. Everything's fine. For this particular trip, I had map and compass. I had just gotten a new phone, so my phone was in good shape. I actually had a GPS with me for the just in case. I made a very conscious decision to leave my spot at home, uh, my in reach um, emergency device, because I just didn't want any more technology than what I already had. So I had this in reach with me and then right when I'm walking out the door my uh, cousin says to me she goes you know at some point um, something's gonna happen on this trip she kind of had a vision of that taking place but don't worry um, you will be supported and cared for and guided and um, it, again kind of one of those uncomfortable feelings but you just kind of toss it to the side and until you start thinking back at how all of these things um, have happened and taken place. So I was getting more signs throughout the trip and I'm going to call these intuitions that I chose to ignore and I want to tell you a little bit about them because I think that they're very valuable in things that you look at and how you recognize what is going on in your environment. What I do want you to know is there are a lot of dumb ways to die. Um, again, you can die for a good reason, a bad reason, or no reason at all, um, but there are some really, really dumb ways to die. And one of the dumb ways to die is to um, not be very aware when you're going into tight canyons and such. So on the second morning of my hike, um, so I'd fallen the first day, I'd gotten all tangled up in the weeds and all that sort of stuff. Um, and weeds, I mean willows that are higher than your head, right? So on the second day, I was going through this really tight slot canyon and there were some cattle out there. So I'd seen these cattle footprints going back and forth 
and I reached this spot in the canyon and it's only about 10 feet wide and I couldn't get down. I couldn't find a way to cross down into the next level. So I'm back and forth and back and forth inside of this canyon and I drop. I finally take off my backpack and I broke one of the cardinal rules and I dropped my backpack down on the other side or down below because my thought was I was going to have to shimmy a little bit. Um, so I drop my backpack and I start looking around and what I start realizing is that there are tufts of deer everywhere. There are tufts of deer fur and there's um, bones in the area. Um, what I notice is that the grass is really high in these willows, meaning that there had been water rushing through here at some point and um, the water will drown you. I mean, you drown very easily in these slot canyons. Um, I noticed that I wasn't going to be able to land safely. I noticed that there was a lot of areas to slip and slide. There was a lot of uh, variables that for me were starting to make me very uncomfortable. Now, for being somebody who has backpacked as long as I have and done as many things as I have, for me to get uncomfortable means that it probably wasn't, there was something going on around me. Um, so this was the first time I can ever think of that I actually said to myself, I really wish I had my in-reach emergency device. And so I made a mental note of that. And when I got out of this canyon later on, about 20 minutes later, I actually sent a text, even though I didn't go out, to my husband that says, please put my in reach in my next drop box. I want to take it with me for the rest of the hike. So these lots of things were going on here in the canyon. I finally was able to wield my way down. And I had to do some kind of one arm push up sort of things to get down there. And I got to this spot and sitting on the ground was a piece of paper. And this piece of paper looked like it had just been put there the day before. It was brand spanking new. It was white with no dirt and it had some language on it. So I picked it up and I looked at it and this piece of paper had on it, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth, when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, say the Lord. That for me was a, a moment of clarity of how much risk I think I was uh, putting myself in as a in, in this canyon. And it was a good reminder that from this point forward, you need to be very hyper aware of your choices and your decisions as you're making them as a part of the hike. Now, don't let it take over your hike. Just make sure that you're again paying attention to those five whys of a bad day. Don't get too hot. Don't get too cold. Don't get too tired. Do all those things that you need to do. And so I made that additional commitment to myself of making these good choices and decisions. So I'm going along as a part of the hike. And then there are a few other symbols that start presenting themselves and a few more kind of tidbits that I started wondering, what is it that this means? One of them that I noticed I noticed it while I was out there and I also noticed it in my journal is that juniper trees. When you get in a landscape that looks like this, there's not a lot of juniper trees. But three times in five days, I make mention of these juniper trees and they're actually my beacon. They're what I use when I'm setting map and compass points, um, when I am trying to go from one it's these juniper trees that I'm off. So juniper, pea, juniper trees um, as the symbol signifies a great journey, but capable of staying true to the self and never compromising your integrity. And the only time the entire, entire trip that I had an easy time getting from point A to point B was in a loca location that was noticed, known as Juniper Gulch. One of the other things that I saw out there were owls. Um, in all my years of hiking, I can count on one hand how many times I've seen owls and I was seeing owls in the pairs while I was out there. And if you look at the wisdom from Greek mythology or even look at it from an Indian uh, Native American perspective, owls are death or um, they also say that it's a source of wisdom. So these were the types of symbols I was getting while I was out there hiking the trail. But I also got one more, which was really um, one of the most fascinating things that I've ever experienced on any hike. 
was I was relying on map and compass. And I would get to places in the trail and I would go to set a bearing just as you would traditionally and my compass would do twirls. It would just swing around on any plum as a part of the hikes. And it got to the point where I would pull my compass out and I would set a bearing and then I would walk away 10 feet and I would set my GPS down and I would have it set a bearing and multiple times I can tell you that they would go in very opposite directions and there were many many occasions and I wish I want you to understand I can't, can't make this up there were many occasions in which they would send me collectively the complete wrong way of the direction that I need knew I needed to go so there were it got to a point and this was on day three that I finally quit following my compass and I quit following my GPS and what I started doing was sight bearings. So I was uh, taking a mark far off on the distance by using my map and that's what I was using to get me from point A to point B. So with that being said on day five. This is where I got to literally and figuratively. Um, what I can tell you is on this particular hike, it didn't end well, but it did end with me being alive. Again, I'm not a proponent of believing in luck. I don't believe luck does you much good, but good thinking does. So reflecting back onto the what if statements, having worked with clients for a lot of years, I'd already thought through a lot of what if statements. You know, what if this were to happen, what would I do? So this is why we all take first aid classes, right? And we take those wilderness first aid classes that take more time and they cost more money. But the reason is so that you can think, think a little differently than what you're gonna do as a back or um, from a basic first aid course. So what has happened is I have had two surgeries and I've had four ER visits. Um, at one point I had 29 staples in my knee. I had I have a five inch scar. Um, the top photo is an x-ray of right after I broke my knee 12 hours later when I was in the ER and the one below that is after we finally took the bandages off for my stitches. Um, the photographs on the right uh, what I'm showing you is how ugly a, a broken knee with the bruising can be and what it actually looked like um, at where I stopped and where I was finally rescued from. Um, I was pretty lucky in terms of I didn't have a tremendous amount of pain. Now, whether that's adrenaline, not thinking about it, um, a lot of variables can come into play there. As long as my knee was straight, I did not have pain. If my knee was not straight, I had a tremendous amount of pain. And this middle photograph here, and I'm gonna try to pop up my um, cursor so you can see this. This is where I came down from. And you can see this little kind of um, rocky, you know, scrib coming down right here and I came down here to the Jordan Creek. Now I showed you an earlier picture from where I had camped that evening um, and then the morning I leave camp and the first bearing I set sends me directly to this little finger on the mesa for me to come down. I double checked my bearings and my bearings would not get me. Um, I eventually just did my own cross country route got to the top of this of this mesa top uh, overlooking the canyon and i felt like that this was a bad choice and a bad decision and i don't know if it's because you hear the water rolling or whether you're just getting tired whatever the reason is um i just thought that maybe this was a bad day or a bad decision but i want to back up you remember that stalking app i was talking about well, it didn't work except for the night before. So the night before I reached this little mesa top here where I came down, I actually turned on my little stalking app and my stalking app worked. And I sent a little text out to everybody saying, hey, I'm fine and the trail is really challenging. I'm very burnt, but everything is good. Tomorrow I will be in Rome Station 
and um, I am going to grab and go from Rome Station. So a grab and go means I'm going to go into where my uh, resupply box is. I'm going to resupply by pulling all my food out, supplement from the convenience store, load up my pack, and I'm going to go back out. So during the midst of this conversation um, by texting, I talked to my husband and I said, don't worry about me if you don't hear about hear from me. It's not a big deal. I'm just going to do this grab and go. Everything is fine. I'm not a big deal. Well, my next town stop is six days away. My husband and I have a three day rule. So that means that if something were to happen here, it would be 10 days before somebody even thought about looking for me because again, my stocking app had gone through and that meant that everything was okay. I was going through Rome Station and I continue to go. So I add to that this uncomfortable feeling that I had on the Mesa top and it didn't matter. I'm a hiker. I go down because I didn't think it was life threatening. I just felt a little uncomfortable. So I got to the river or to the river edge. This is actually a creek. This is called the Jordan Creek. It's very muddy. Um, and I got to the edge of the creek and for this particular trip, I had not only my, my hiking shoes, but I had five finger Vibram sole shoes. And I brought those specifically for these big river crossings so that I could keep my um, my traditional hiking shoes dry and they're lightweight, so it wasn't a big deal. So I sat down and I put on my hiking shoes or my five five room shoes and I went and started crossing the creek. Now I also had in my backpack a big orange trash bag and so I had wrapped all my gear inside my my backpack inside this um, inside this big orange trash bag before I left the riverbank. Um, I went into the river. I didn't like where I was at. I came back out. I found a new spot a little further up the river and I came across the river. I got to the other side of the river and I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but it's right below this little green spot. Right in here is where I came out of the river and it's very excuse me, it's very marshy, it's very wet, it's very hard to get a good footing and get a good foothold. And I was snagging my feet quite a bit and I finally just fell. And what happened when I fell is that there is one piece of volcanic rock that is about 18 inches um, wide. It's only about six inches in um, depth there and it's all rocky. And my knee hit that just perfectly, and all I heard was a thud. And there wasn't any pain at this point, but I knew that my knee was broken. Now, like any good person who's injured themselves, I tried to get up. And if something that's kind of gross to think about, but your knee goes the wrong way when the patella is broken. And so it's kind of like getting hit in the head with the bottom of your knee, but not quite because it can't come up that far. Well, by looking at my leg, so now I'm back obviously on the ground again, looking at my leg, here's what I noticed, that the top part of my patella is in my thigh and the bottom part of my patella is below the normal kind of location for your knee, right? Which just means your muscles are pulling them. So I take both hands and I rub the top of my thigh and I shove my patella downwards to my knee because I don't know, it just seemed the right thing to do, right? Um, shove that down and then that took away some of the pain, the seizing that was taking place uh, and it forced me to keep my legs straight. Well, now I have to leave this marshy area and it's very crowded. Now you can look in these pictures here and it looks like there's a little space, but if you look at the photo or down below closer to the creek, what you'll notice that there's a lot of sagebrush through there. You can't get through that easy and this is the big sagebrush. This is the sagebrush that you know can be as tall as I am in places. So the first thing that I do is that I recognize that we are in an emergency situation, right? And I'm by myself. So I start backing up out of this marsh by, um, I kept my pack on and by literally kind of like back swimming, trying to get out of this marshy area. And I moved myself backwards until I found the driest spot that I had been in. And from here is where you have to start making decisions. Now, I'm not gonna tell you that I panicked because I don't think I panicked. 
And I'm going to tell you that in situations like these, there is no time for crying. I cried a little later coming up this mountain. I did not cry there because no one has time for crying in these particular scenarios. So I backed myself up. I take off my backpack and I start very methodically going through my pack, trying to decide what it is that I need to keep and what it is that I need to get rid of. And I need to figure out how to splint my leg at this point because here's what I know as clear as day. I either get out of this canyon or I die in this canyon. There is not an in-between. Nobody is coming to look for me. Nobody is coming down this river. Nobody is coming out here on this trail. I knew that the only way that I was going to live was that I had to get out of this canyon and get back onto the mesa top. From there, what I knew is that I was I was already less than five miles from Roan Station, but I also knew that once I got to the top of this canyon that I was hitting an old four track, an old um, kind of side by side track. And I knew that if I could get to that track, I could backpedal my entire way to the highway. This was one section that had a 1.9 mile section of trail that was on the highway. So I don't have to go five miles at this point. I need to go three miles and I can backpedal most of that as long as I can get in the, out of this canyon. So here's what happens is I exit the Jordan Creek at 830, give or take. This is when the accident takes place. What I do from here is I start splinting my knee. I go methodically through everything in my pack. I begin to discard items that I can't take with me. I am not in a position where I can take a full pack and I can take me to the top of this canyon and I knew that. So I leave my shoes there. I take the shoelaces. I leave my fuel bottle there because I'm not making any food. I don't have that much food left at this point. Um, I leave my stove. I leave all my extra maps. I leave everything that I can except for my sleeping bag because I know that I may need that. And that's the one thing that we tell people in an emergency, use this as your extra fluff. I wasn't gonna use my sleeping bag as fluff because I knew that there was a chance that I'm gonna need it at some point. I pulled out my thermo rest and I knew that that was what I was gonna have to use as the foundation to wrap my legs so that I could have a splint. I didn't want to use my tent poles because I figured at some point I would maybe need my tent. So I didn't have that for extra fluff material either. And then I also pulled the shoelaces from my shoes so that I could use those to tighten the knots. So all I had were my hiking poles that I could use for my splint, my thumb arrest, and my shoelace. Now, now, one of the things that had happened on the first day of this hike is that my shoelaces, even though I typically do double knot shoes, my shoelaces were always coming undone. And I got really frustrated by this. And, and so after tying your shoes multiple times, one of the things that I had thought about was that I should just start doing a surgeon's knot on my shoelaces, which is really dumb. You wouldn't normally think of doing something like this. So I started tying my shoes into a surgeon knot each morning. The only thing that was holding <laughs> my splint together was the fact that I was using these same surgeon knots for the two pieces of um, laces that were used on my on my knee splint. So I blew up my thermo rest the best that I could. I wrapped around um, that around my hiking poles the best that I could. And that was going to be it is what it is. You know, it, it doesn't have to be pretty. It needs to be functional and as functional as it can be. The other thing that I did is I took my whistle that was on the front of my pack and I strapped it to my bra strap. And once I got my splint done, I started toting on that whistle. So I would make three calls on that whistle and I would wait. And I'd make three calls on that whistle and I wait. This became a part of the process of what it was that I was doing. It became again methodical as the way all of this, all of this becomes. So I'm toting on my whistle. I have in my backpack only the things I absolutely must have. I get out my cell phone and I send a message that says I'm at the Jordan Creek crossing of the Oregon Desert Trail with a broken knee. Please send help and I will drag myself towards the rim and I sent the coordinates. Now, 
I wasn't smart enough to figure out a lot of things on my phone, but what I figured out in this short time here is that I had to get off all of the apps and the things that would suck the battery from my phone because I may need it. And I happened to find some accidental emergency setting on there, which was great because it shut down all the background stuff, but it allowed me to send just text messages out. And what I did for the next five hours is I moved. I didn't drink anything. I didn't eat anything. And I knew one of the things that was going to be a problem at some point was that I was going to run out of water because I can tell you right now I wasn't getting back into that Jordan Creek in order to get water when I had a broken leg. I was just willing to kind of take that as it was. And here's how the process worked. I got out of the creek. Um, I started, I changed out of my long sleeve shirt and I put on my puffball jacket. Again, these are the layers that you take for just in case, right? These are your 10 essentials. So I took my long sleeve shirt. I tied it to the back of my pack because I needed that to start drying in case I needed it later. I put on my dry shirt because I was already cold, right? And I began moving backwards. And here's how the process worked. I could not go downhill. My knee could not take that. It would seize up. And with that seizing, I would have to try to stretch it out. So that wasn't an option for me. The only thing I could do was scoot backwards and scoot, side, scoot sideways. So I wind my way through the sagebrush and then I get to this rocky kind of terrain and I move myself by simply picking up my left leg and moving it over into like a V. So think of yourself as like wide legged. I would pick it up and I would move it and then I would put my hands down and I would move the rest of my body to my leg. And then I would lean to my right and I would grab my backpack and I would pull that backpack to me. And I repeated this process for five hours, stopping only to send regular text out with new coordinates because I wanted somebody, if, if um, once Boone got the text messages, to know exactly where I was at. I thought about nothing else. Um, one time I cried, but I gave myself 30 seconds to cry and I was like, you've got to move. You'll notice in that previous picture, there were some dark clouds starting to form. If it's not that, it's the fact that it gets really damn hot. Um, I, there's some variables that I don't want to have to deal with if I don't have to. So I continue to move up this mountain. Now I want to backtrack for just a moment. On this picture here, <laughs> I don't have that many pictures of the Oregon Desert Trail. And I have this picture because when I reach the top, um, or, or I'm almost to the Mesa top, I asked because I knew that nobody would believe where it was when my accident occurred. So my accident occurred down over here and that I came up this entire terrain. Now this little black spot here, this big cliffy thing, doesn't look like much in the picture. They're actually more of a big deal than you think they are. Because you can't see over them because you're sliding on your butt, you kind of have to just go with the best of it. You know, what's going to happen when you get up there? My husband actually said, what were you going to do if you got to the top of that and there was a rattlesnake? And I was like, well, that was just going to be another problem to contend with. But there was no way for me to go down and to drag myself so all I could do was continue to go upwards. Now I had on a running skirt at this point so my running skirt is getting really full of gravel and rocks and all that sort of thing. My leg is moving upwards. I have to stop now and again to kind of relieve the seizing but it's five hours of not thinking of anything else except for it's time to tote on the whistle. Okay it's time to move your leg and this is what the process was for me to get to the top of this mesa. So I get to the top of this mesa and a hailstorm comes in like I have not seen before. At least that's what it felt like for the moment. Remember I said one of the things I saved was my tent. So what I did is I put up my tent very quickly, as quickly as that can be with a broken leg, and I kind of shoved myself in it. Um, and then I sent another text message out that said this is where I will be. And after a short period of time, I actually got a response and the response was from my husband who says copy. Now you have to understand Boone works for the United States Forest Service. They have learned to be brief, 
Um, but when your wife is sitting at the edge of a canyon with a broken leg in the middle of nowhere, I'm not sure what in the hell copy means. So I have to actually send some follow-up messages to say, I don't want to crawl anymore. Are you actually sending help? Whereby he confirms that he is sending help. So at this point, a little more time passes. I actually get a text message from the deputy. So Mal your county only has three search and rescue guys. They were actually out on a rescue from earlier that morning. Um, the deputy was so there was a deputy in the area and they were trying to confirm where I was at. Boone was under the assumption that I'd already gone through Roan Station because you know it's already pretty darn late in the day. They didn't know where I was at. So part of the thinking ahead guys is what are you going to do? What is it that you're going to tell people? I actually took a photo of my map and sent him messages with this is where I'm at, which I was at OC 113 um, where Rome Station was so that he knew what side of the highway was on. And we did some back and forth like that for a period of time so that he can confirm my location as well as having um, GPS coordinates. So he said to me, don't worry, somebody's coming. We'll be there within a period of time. I knew at the earliest that help would come to me somewhere in around four hours. Um, in the midst of all this, and I just put a time frame on my little timeline here, um, I hear an ATV in the distance and I know exactly that ATV sound is. And I thought, oh my goodness, search and rescue is getting here earlier. Um, so I start again. Remember, I have that orange trash bag because I want to be easily seen. When I put up my tent, I actually hung that orange trash bag out so that it would be seen from a distance. And I have an orange bandana as well with me on this particular trip. And I heard that ATV and I come crawling out of my tent and I'm waving this stuff for all it's worth. I want this person to see me. And then the ATV disappears a bit. And then I hear it come back to the side of me and here's this little guy sitting in this ATV. Now at this point, just as a kind of funny, you know that in your, when you're in an emergency situation that you need to do self care first. I didn't have many snacks, but I had some snacks and I had a little bit of water and I was trying to figure out what to do with my leg. I was also very wet by this point. Um, and that was from the rainstorm. My skirt had dried out, um, but it got re it got wet again with the rainstorm. So I knew that I needed to do things to warm myself. So I had my sleeping bag wrapped around me and I was trying to change my pants and get into dry pants and that sort of thing. So this rancher comes up on his UTV and he turns it off and I'm kind of like sprawled and trying to get out of my tent and I was and I him. I said, were you sent here to help me? And he says, no, I wanted to know what you were doing on private property. So this was Richard, the local rancher. He had been missing some cattle when he saw my tent. So he wanted to know what I was doing on private property. And I told him that I was hiking the Oregon Desert Trail, but I, that I fell down and then I broke my leg and that I really could use some of his help. And he said, OK, that's fine. He didn't know what he was getting himself into. I didn't know what he's getting himself into. And so he makes his way over to me um, after he calls his son, which is friends with one of the search and rescue guys. And what they do is they start backing forth on the phone and on their text messaging about exactly where I'm located at. And through that, we were able to reduce the amount of time it took for search and rescue to get to me. Now, my husband hates this story, but I think it's a really funny story, so I want to tell you anyway. When he got to my tent and I told him I had a broken leg and we were kind of chatting about what the options were, he asked me, is there anything that I can help you with right now? Now, remember, I had on wet clothes. When I took off my wet clothes and I was putting on my pants, what I realized is I couldn't bend my knee to put on my pants. So I was sitting there with one leg into a pair of fleecy pants and one leg out of fleecy pants and a sleeping bag wrapped around me. And so I say to this guy, he's 68 or 69 years old. Somebody told me, but they weren't sure what she was. I said, will you help me put on my pants? And he said he would help 
me put on my pants and he did. And then he asked me, what else can I help you with? And I said, can you help me put on my socks? So I figured this guy, he's been raising cattle for his entire life and has lots of them and grown children. He was quite capable of doing something that maybe he hadn't done previously. Now remind you, this is Easter weekend. So what happened on Easter weekend when he went to Easter dinner is that he probably told his family that this was not the normal Easter weekend of what he would have. So I only have about two minutes left. Um, I got out, things were great. I was in the hospital in the ER within 12 hours. Um, it's unusual that you would have a rescue operation that would go that quickly. A lot of that had to do with just being in the right place in the right time is timing, which is where the rancher was. Um, so they they were able to get me out pretty quickly. It took a two hours on a four wheel drive road and took another two hours on highway before we got me to the nearest hospital. We got to the hospital and the ER doctor said that he thought that maybe I had just dislocated my knee and I said to him, do you really think so? And then he got the uh, x-ray back and it was confirmed that I'd broken my patella. And um, there have been a few hiccups along the way. Uh, and I do think it's important to share these sorts of things because it's it's often not as simple as a broken leg. Um, for a lot of people, the broken leg and the getting out part, they have to deal with some of the psychological pieces. We have all heard of people who have fallen, have gotten hurt, their search and rescue, things like that have taken place. Um, so it's it's interesting to talk to these people and hear what their experiences have been. Um, mine came with a few hiccups. I've had two surgeries, four emergency room visits. Um, the biggest emergency room visit I had was five weeks after the accident when um, I ended up with blood clots in my legs that um, went from the um, my quad, the top of my quad to my ankles. And um, that ended up having pulmonary embolisms. One of them let loose and ended up with pulmonary embolisms in both of my lungs. Um, so the consequences now is that I have some lung damage and I have lost the bottom left part of my lung. I don't let it really slow me down a lot. Um, but what I do let you know is this last picture of me in this beautiful ground gown and the walker on the right side. That was the first time I was allowed to stand up and walk. And so I say kind of tongue in cheek that if uh, it cost me many, many thousands of dollars for somebody to let me walk, then that was the price I paid to fall in a canyon and to come back out and to be able to walk a little bit later. So I want to thank you guys for letting me attend and play with you this evening. I tried to be timely here. I think Margaret's going to take this back over and then if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Great, thank you so much, Stacy. We, so we, we did have a few questions. Few um, questions. So the first uh, one. So the first one is you've mentioned a lot of western trails. Western trails. Have you done anything in the east? Have you done anything in the Appalachian Trail? If yes, what are the major differences? Major East and West. East and West. Oh, there are lots of differences. So yes, I've hiked a lot of trails out east. Um, before we moved to Colorado, my husband and I lived in New Hampshire. So we've hiked almost everything there is in the presidential range, the Appalachian Trail, uh, the Cohas Trail, Long Trail, any of those big trails we've hit as well as some of the smaller trails uh, that are up in this area. So the biggest difference between east and west is um, when we have West Coast people that come to the East Coast, they kind of uh, look their nose down at our mountains, which because they're not as tall. But here's the thing, the mountains out East tend to be um, just as steep, but more difficult to climb. There's more rocks out here, more roots out here, more water out here. Um, and they're not going to do switchbacks because we don't have horses on the East Coast trails, whereas the West Coast trails tend to be more open, big grandiose views, higher altitude. Um, so you tend to suffer from altitude sickness out there from lack of water, whereas out here in the East, you tend to have more water than you know what to do with. And the most you're going to get is kind of scraped knees and a dry tongue from trying to get up the mountains themselves. They're very different landscapes.
Another question, um, have you worked at all with guiding people with mobility issues or limitations due to medical issues? Unmute yourself. Um, so in the early days, we had a few clients with multiple sclerosis and we actually worked with other organizations to give them that kind of um, that, that uh, per se. I have had clients who have hiked entire trails with a you know, crutch like um, uh, apparatus because they were having some failure in their lower limbs and that's how they hiked their trails. Um, most people that hike with us tend to have, they tend to be an older generation, so they've already got pains and aches and such as that. But as far as um, really serious limiting, we have not had that. We're not in the, in the Western mountains, we're not as well equipped to deal with that. Another one, do you feel Another stronger one. or wiser or weaker because of this experience? And if you want to unmute yourself now. Thanks for that unmute reminder. Um, it, it's an interesting place to be. I mean, I'm two years into this. Uh, when the accident happened, we knew pretty, in, pretty pretty quickly that the chances of me having full mobility were pretty limited, but we were going to work and strive for that. Um, the problem for me came with the the PEs when. If you don't know much about it, the ability to breathe is very, very important and the PEs was it was life or death for me. The same as that canyon was that canyon I knew I had to get out of. When it came to the PE, I knew that there was less than an hour for me to live. Um, I just didn't have that breath. So emotionally, that's taken the biggest toll for me is trying to deal with those kind of variables. Um, I continue to get stronger every day. I, I can no longer run. So being an ultra runner, somebody who ran 100 mile races, you know, that's really not in the cards for me right now. But I can walk and I can hike. And I maybe don't do four mile an hour pace anymore or three mile, three and a half mile hour pace in the mountains here in, on the East Coast. Um, I can still pretty much get a nice clip in there and I can do it with a full backpack. Um, so my confidence for my skills was enhanced. It's it's just like taking a map and compass bearing and following it for a mile and reaching exactly where you got to. and. I am forever amazed whenever I do that. I mean, every time I set a bearing for that distance and I get there, I get to the end and I go, wow, that shit really works because it does. And I kind of feel the same and why I'm willing to share my story is that all of these things that guides and first aid instructors that we're trying to teach people, it works. And it works because you are um, taking a moment to walk through all of the pieces so that you can get out of a situation alive or that you can have an experience and and never have to use those skill sets. Again, you know, accidents happen um, and I do consider this an accident. I mean, there can be the question and I raised it. Is there a sixth reason of why you can have a bad day? And I will say that fear is that sixth reason. You know, if I tell my clients to be intuitive, and to do what they need to do, then these skills are actually working. Awesome, thank you so much, Stacy, And thank you everybody who tuned in tonight. And uh, we just wanna remind you that we'll be back on um, with Ellen on April 1st at seven o'clock. And you can check out all the other ones that are coming after that. Um, this will be posted on our YouTube page and will be shared on Facebook and the website as well if you kind of tuned in a little late or had to leave a little early, whatever it is, or want to share it with friends. So thank you again and we hope you have a good rest of your night.